We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2 today. If you grab a Bible that we have here, it's on page 1028. 1028. We're going to be in verses 23 to 26. We're in a series right now on the fruit of the Spirit. And that's actually in Galatians chapter 5. It's a list of various fruits of the Spirit and uh, the names of them. And then what we're doing is we're highlighting one of those different elements, and then we're going to another place in the Bible to figure out, well, what does that look like exactly? So let me read both of the, of the passages here. We'll do Galatians 5, we'll do the list, and then I'll read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 23 to 26. Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And now for 2 Timothy chapter 2, sorry, I have it wrong in my notes. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 to 26. I hear a lot of rustling. That's probably my fault because you're like, wait, what is he saying? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 to 26. To 26. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your help right now. As we've opened your word, we're praying that by your spirit, through your word, you would speak to us and you would help us to see the beauty of gentleness and the way in which being a gentle person really is the way of Christ. So, Lord, would you perform the work that we need in and through us to make us a gentle people for your glory. Amen. I am to the point now where I view gentleness as essential to Christianity. It is not some extra thing that some people might graduate into. It really is a key feature of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We hear it in the Lord's own invitation. It's a part of who he is. It's a part of his nature. And in Matthew chapter 11, he, Jesus himself says this, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says what we should do. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And here's why. For I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. When Jesus invites us to deal with him, and he says, I'd love for you to come to me. I'd love for you to take on my my way. I'd love for you to take on my, my teaching and my yoke and all these different things. And he says, here's why. Because I am gentle and humble in heart. And therefore, you will find rest for your soul. When we talk about who Jesus is and what he's like, he is gentle. And that actually... Is not a weakness in him. It's in reality, it's a profound strength. And so, gentleness is essential to Christianity. So here we are in Second Timothy chapter two, and I want to give you four different lessons on gentleness from this passage. And uh, the the idea shows up here of gentleness. It tells us that we need to gently instruct, but really, gentleness is kind of uh, on the forefront of this entire paragraph. So four lessons on gentleness from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Number one, gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict. Gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict. We could say it like this, gentle people are conflict avoidant. Not because they're spineless, not because they don't enjoy that sort of thing, not because they have a temperament that is uh, resistant to conflict, they, they do it as a matter of conviction. Gentle people recognize 
there are certain controversies that will result in absolutely no good. Therefore, I have no business engaging in those. Notice in verse 23 how it reads. It says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. There are certain controversies that we can recognize right out of the gate. This will go nowhere good. There, there is no winning if I engage in this sort of thing. Here's some low-hanging fruit. It's the comment section online, right? Like all of us kind of, you know, we'll chuckle about that because we know there's never going to be a, a, an argument in a comment section that is going to properly persuade somebody to change their opinion on something. Like, oh, yeah, you know what? This guy here, user number whatever, convinced me of my errors on this online platform. That's just in that, in that environment... We can say most of the time, I would be tempted to say almost all of the time, that those sorts of dialogues are foolish and stupid, and all they result in is quarreling. Um, They rarely result in anything good. But when Paul was writing this, he wasn't thinking about the internet, right? He wasn't thinking, you know what, we better steer clear of arguments on the internet because they're they're not going to result in much good. He was actually giving us a category that there are a lot of different controversies that aren't going to be productive. They will only result in quarreling. And so those are the things that gentle people are avoidant of. We recognize with wisdom and through prayer that there are certain arguments that we are not willing to engage in because we know it will not result in convincing somebody of something and it will not result in the upbuilding of myself or, or anyone else. So on principle, we avoid these sorts of things. John Newton, we know him from the hymn Amazing Grace. And we love that hymn. Um, But one of the things that a lot of people don't know is that he was a pastor, and some of his best work was preserved for us in his letter writing, and it was later published. So there are letters of of John Newton, and a lot of them are really, really helpful. He was an insightful guy. But he wrote one in particular that I want to draw your attention to. He wrote to a buddy who was engaged in controversy, and he wrote a letter to him, and it was later published and titled, on controversy, and you can Google it and find it very easily. But I want to share with you his insights. So he's writing to his friend, and he's reminding him, you know, gentle people are conflict avoidant. So he says, be careful here, buddy, because you could get yourself off track very quickly. So he writes like this. I think we, we might have this quote for us, but here it is. Controversies, for the most part, this is Newton writing, controversies, for the most part, are so managed as to indulge rather than to repress the wrong disposition. He goes on to say, and therefore, generally speaking, they are productive of little good. They provoke those whom they should convince, and they puff up those whom they should edify. Did you catch that? He's saying, okay, I know you want to have this debate. I know you want to have this, you know, issue with this person and you want to explain your your cause and all these different things. And he says, but but recognize right out of the gate, there is a limitation here. Controversies often do not produce what you hope they will produce. They often uh, indulge the wrong disposition and they often provoke those who are engaged in it in different ways that are unhealthy. So the person who is arguing for something becomes self-righteous and prideful uh, and aggressive, and the person who is on the opposite end ends up being defensive and hurt. And, and what he's saying is this, for, for the most part, controversies do little good. So be careful. And he gave three different headings here in this letter, and I'm, I'm going to share them real quick. We'll, we'll fly through them. But he says, okay, when, if you're going to do this, here are three pastoral suggestions for you. Number one, consider your opponent. If you're going to engage in controversy, consider your opponent. If they're a believer, if they're a brother or sister in Christ, then you should have a heart of tenderness toward them. So your controversy with them actually should reflect the gentleness of the Lord. If they're a believer, make sure that you're thinking about that relationship with them that will endure for all of eternity and let that inform the way in which you will argue with them. If they're not a believer, he says, well, then they should elicit a tremendous amount of our compassion. If they're not a believer, our hearts should be drawn to them 
And we should desire that they would be persuaded to see the beauty of Christ and what he's done. And so we should treat them with that sort of care and respect and desire for their good. So consider your opponent. But then he says, also consider the public. And what he means by that is when you do conflict, there are repercussions. There are people who are watching. And he says, you, you should be mindful of the fact that the people who are observing you and the way in which you're doing this controversy, they're making conclusions about Christianity based off of you. And he says, the, if they're unbelievers they, and you're arguing, they might, they're not qualified. This is what Newton is saying. They're not qualified to judge doctrine. They don't know the things of God. They can't accurately discern truth in that regard. But he says they are able to accurately discern whether or not you have the spirit of Christ, whether you have the, the vibe of the gentleness of the Lord himself. And they make that determination right away. They notice right away the tone with which you argue for your cause. And he says, if people are catching you fall short of the gentleness of Jesus, they will quickly dismiss you entirely. And here's the, here's the downside. They may even dismiss Christianity because of you. That's a scary thing. But he says, consider the public. Consider the effect that you are having on the witness of Jesus Christ. And this is very, very relevant. I want you to think about the, the way in which people experience you. So when you show up to work tomorrow, do they experience something of the Spirit of Christ in you so that way they're being drawn toward him? the gentleness, the kindness, the humility, and those sorts of things? Or do they see somebody who is contrary to Christ and is aggressive and hostile, condemning, judgmental, self-righteous, and all these different things? So that way they, they would look at you and go, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want anything to do with that. So we need to consider the, the effect that our arguments have on the observers that we deal with regularly, co-workers, family members, friends, they're all watching us. And then he says, consider yourself. Thirdly, consider yourself. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains his cause and silences his adversary, if at the same time he loses that humble, tender frame of spirit in which the Lord delights and to which the promise of the Lord's presence is made? If you forfeit the gentleness of the Lord on display in you, you're not winning. If you're willing to win an argument at the expense of you misbehaving to prove your point or to argue your case, John Newton is saying, man, consider how that affects you. That, that is a dangerous thing to do. So gentle people, lesson number one, gentle people avoid unnecessary conflict, recognizing the danger intrinsic to it and the limitations of it in accomplishing the purposes of God. Secondly, gentle people are relationally wise. Look at verse 24. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And it's giving us these different categories here. Let's take them one at a time. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. And we've already touched on this in the previous point, but, but it needs to be stated again. We're saying that we, on principle, need to be the kind of people who are not known for always being in controversy. If we're following the Lord, that's, just, that's not his way. We shouldn't be known for always being you know, in some sort of skirmish with, with people around us. We must not. And it is a command here. All these are commanded to us. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. The Lord's servant, it goes on in verse 24 to say, must be kind to all. And I was thinking this week about how much I dislike that word everyone here, uh, where it shows up and says, you must be kind to everyone. And the reason why I dislike it is because I would like a limit placed on how, how far my kindness must go. But the Bible says, no, if you're following Jesus, it means that you are looking at all of these different opportunities, all of these people that you're coming in contact with, and you have this obligation, you must be kind to everyone. And this is a high calling 
is it not? That we would be kind to all that we come in contact with. And then it goes on to say we have to be able to teach. Verse 24, uh, the third phrase there, we must be able to teach. And, and you might go, Corey, I don't see the connection here. You said gentle people are relationally wise. What does teaching have to do with that? It has a lot to do with it. Teaching is the activity whereby you are relaying information for the sake of your student. Uh, Dr. Howard Hendricks, he has this little book, and it's called Teaching to Change Lives. It's a beautiful little book on, on uh, teaching the Bible. And he, he has this zinger in there, and I'm going to share it with you. But he says, good teachers can't be focused on what they do, but on what their students are doing. See, the ability to teach says it doesn't, like the way in which the presentation is going is not the point. The point is, are the students receiving this? That's a relational thing. Teaching then is a very relational thing. It's, emph it's emphasizing the importance of helping people come to know and understand stuff. And so in this regard, in, in terms of uh, the Lord's servant and somebody who's teaching the way of God, it's saying, your job is to help people come to grasp the reality of God. And until that happens, you've not taught. Teaching is where the audience is, is receiving the, the benefit. And so it, it's a very relational thing. So we just need to recognize, you know, in, in the opportunities that we have to speak about God, our goal is not for us to sound smart or to do a good job presenting our information. Our end game is, are the people who are listening to us hearing it? Are they receiving this? Are they learning about the glory of God and the person and work of Christ? Are they hearing the good news of the gospel? Because an aptitude to teach is concerned with others, not with us. And finally, not resentful. The Lord's servant must not be resentful. And this is getting at that kind of relational dynamic that we can deal with people and we can you know, hold bitterness and resentment in our hearts and, and it does great harm to the witness of Christ. But gentle people are not resentful. And uh, I'll just be straight with you. Last night we were at my niece's birthday party and um, we were just interacting and this kind of offhand uh, comment was made. And... Later on, I was, it just reminded me of some previous hurt. So it just, we're just hanging out, eating cake, you know, how can that go wrong? Uh, having a good time celebrating my niece for her birthday. And this little, little just kind of jest was made, totally innocent, totally appropriate, all these different things. But in my head now, there's this, this reminder of something that has happened previously that was a hurtful experience, and now all of a sudden, resentment starts to come up in me. And I'm just being straight with you so you guys can feel, you know, how this ordinarily works. And, you know, last night I had a really, really hard time going to sleep because here's what was going on in my heart. It was spiritual warfare. It was, the Bible is saying here, the Lord's servant must not be resentful. And here I am with these hurts that I'm bringing up and I'm dwelling on and I'm thinking about, and then I'm getting angry, and I'm getting resentful. And so when I say this stuff, and I'm standing up here preaching to you about this idea of being gentle, don't mishear me. This is not some little like, hey guys, let's go out of here and be a gentle people. This will be easy, right? We'll just choose to do it, and then we'll get after it. No, this is warfare. This is, this is I have to bring my stuff to the cross, I have to bring the reality of who I am to the person and work of Christ, and he has to change me. And by the power of the, of the gospel and through the work of the Holy Spirit, I have to be a changed individual because the gentle person is relationally wise and therefore is not resentful. So a gentle person is relationally wise. Third, a gentle person uses gentleness as a feature in their ministry meaning it becomes strategy. So not just a disposition, but now a commitment. This is how, this is how I'm going to do ministry for the Lord's sake. Look at verse 25. Opponents must be 
gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So this now becomes a feature of our ministry. We're dealing with people. We, we might have to tell them something that they don't want to hear. We could consider them to be an opponent. But our obligation and our strategy is that as followers of Jesus, we would be gentle individuals, and then we would gently instruct. We would gently instruct with the hope that God will grant repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Let, let me just put it like this. Would you rather win arguments or win people? Would you rather win your argument at the expense of, again, what we said earlier, the forfeiture of the gentleness of Jesus? Would you rather win the argument and prove yourself right, or would you rather win people? Gentleness is the strategy to effectively persuade. There's an old saying. uh, It's attributed to Dale Carnegie, but it's much older than his work. But it says this, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. There are lots of moments where you will feel like you just did a slam dunk in that argument, and they concede. But the reality is they do not agree. If you have persuaded them against their will because of the forcefulness of your argument or the tone with which you engaged in that, and they say, you know what, fine. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Nothing has changed. Nobody has won. Believers in Christ have to gently instruct. It means that we have to deal with people and go, you know what, I'm playing the long game here. I want to love this person, and I want the the disposition with which I engage with them to reflect the character of Christ. I want there to be a calm and cool and reasonable uh, expression of concern for them in the way in which I talk. And this is unusual, by the way. This is incredibly unusual. As as one author put it, he said, you know, it's so easy to be a harsh leader. But to be a gentle leader, that's divine. Like, it's just so easy to try to think, I've got my way and everyone needs to, you know, get on board and, and all these different things. But to be a gentle leader, that's a work of God. So gentle people use gentleness as a feature of effective ministry. They, they approach people with that strategy to try to win them to Christ. Fourth, the fourth lesson here is that gentle people are a part of a ministry of liberation. This is incredible. I mean, this is maybe the best part of the sermon. If you choose to be gentle, you get to be on the front line of doing ministry whereby you are rescuing people from their enslavement to Satan. I'm not making this up. Look at verse 26. So if you take this approach, verse 25, gently instructing people, maybe God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of truth. Then verse 26, here's what it says, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. So by choosing to go into your relationship with a purposeful, a convictional gentleness, you may have the opportunity to watch somebody who is enslaved to Satan experience liberation. How cool is that? I mean, what other, what other invitation could trump that? What other invitation feels better than that, that you could be a part of seeing people rescued from Satan? It's a ministry of liberation when you participate in in gentleness. Jonathan Edwards, he talked about gentleness and he talked about this approach and, and he made this incredible point in one of his sermons about how this is the work of advancing the kingdom. This is this is spiritual warfare, to be convictionally gentle. And he, he says this the strength of the good soldier of Jesus Christ appears in nothing more than in steadfastly maintaining the holy calm, meekness, sweetness, and benevolence of his mind amidst all the storms, injuries, strange behavior, and surprising acts and events of this evil and unreasonable world. I know that's a lot in this archaic language. What Jonathan Edwards was saying is, the world is crazy, 
But one of the ways that you can advance the kingdom of Jesus Christ in this world is by you choosing to remain cool, calm, and collected and to display the spirit of Christ when everything else looks chaotic. By doing that, you, you are actually demolishing the strongholds of Satan. Uh, this is wild, but you purposing and praying to be a person who reflects the character of Christ, it really is the advancement of the kingdom. You, you are now declaring the lordship of Christ, and it is, it is showing up emotionally. It's showing up emotionally in that you are able to, to go through this evil and unreasonable world with all of its strange behavior, all of its surprising acts and events, and you're able to do that in a way that reflects the person and work of Jesus Christ. You will be a part of this ministry of liberation. But Edwards goes on and he warns, he says, listen, but the devil is very tricky. So don't just think this will be an easy thing for you to do. And he says, in fact, be warned because one of the particular areas of vulnerability for us, we're going to say we want to we we punch the devil in his mouth by being kind. We want him to experience a setback because of the people of Park City Church. We, we want to be engaged in this ministry of gentleness. He says, well, be careful because there is something you need to be warned about. Your passion is actually one of the biggest vulnerabilities that you have. Edward says, uh, there's nothing more liable to a corrupt mixture than zeal. Okay? I don't know if that makes sense to you, but as believers, we get very, very passionate about truth, and we call it zeal. We have zeal for the Lord. One of the dangers of zeal is that it is corruptible. We can become passionate for the things of God, and we can actually infuse our passion for truth with our own sinfulness, and it becomes a corrupt mixture. And here's how Edwards puts it. The devil scatters the flock of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is scattered, and he sets them, the devil is doing this, he's setting them one against another, and that with great heat of spirit, under the notion of zeal for God. In other words, we use our commitment to truth as an excuse to sin. We have this banner of zeal for the Lord, and we go out, and we're like crusaders for the truth of God, but we do it in such a way that we forfeit the gentleness of Jesus Christ, and we onboard the, the hateful, resentful, malicious spirit of the enemy, and we begin to weaponize our truth against others, and we do great harm. We as a church have to recognize this is spiritual warfare. We are being called to join the Lord himself in his ministry of kindness, in his ministry of gentleness, gently instructing our opponents with the hope that God would grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. We have to engage in this ministry in a way that reflects the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have to come to the one who says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. He's inviting us to participate in his ministry, and if we're willing, he will use us for his glory, and it will be a beautiful thing as people come to see the work of Christ and come to faith in him. Let's pray right now. Lord, we ask for an anointing on your people. We've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit and walking in step with the Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would pour out your Spirit on your people. I pray that we would be markedly different, that we would become a people who behave like Christ in this crazy world, and that people would be able to see in us the beauty of the good news of the gospel on display in the way that we live and in the dispositions that we have and the, the way that we conduct ourselves, Lord. May we glorify you in all that we're doing. And specifically today, we're asking that you would give us the Spirit of Christ that we could be a gentle people who are living beautifully in this world for his glory. We pray in his name. Amen.